welcome to today's Superior Health Regional COVID-19 Virtual Open Forum. My name is Eva Panetta. I'm a Community Coalition Improvement Advisor at Superior Health. And as always, I want to begin by expressing our sincere appreciation to each and every one of you for all that you do. You all continue to do remarkable work in the face of many challenges and unknowns, and our community are in a better place. All right, I got it. Thank you for your dedication and your commitment. As a reminder, the purpose of today's call, if you are joining us for the first time, is to provide a venue for networking and sharing about COVID-19 concerns across all settings of healthcare. This call is meant to be driven by you, so please use this opportunity to share and collaborate, share success stories and barriers and concerns. We at Superior Health will be here to support you in any way we can, and we continue to learn, um, to learn alongside with you in this ever-changing environment. If you're not familiar with Superior Health Quality Alliance, we were formed in 2018 with eight healthcare organizations across six states, which many of you are very familiar with and have worked with in the past. We are working to achieve the broad national CMS quality strategic aims, and we have come together with a common goal of collaboratively improving the quality of health and health care for consumers, patients, clinicians, and organizations and communities we serve. Please consider joining us as we continue this work across the five-year span to improve the care for residents of our state. You can learn more by visiting our Superior Health public page. Before we get started, I also wanted to do a few housekeeping announcements. Uh, please note that all sessions will be recorded, and we have compiled a running list of notes and answers from previous calls covering such topics as telehealth medicine, transfer issues, access to personal protection equipment, protocols, guidance on using homemade masks. We have also developed a resource compendium, which you will find in our weekly email announcements. In a few seconds, my colleague Elena will open a polling question. And we sincerely appreciate your consideration on completing this poll as we continue to evaluate and search for tools and resources that can help support you on this journey. We want to remind you to mute yourself when you are not speaking and remind you to unmute yourself and state your name when you participate in the discussion. Remember to please do not disclose any personal health information during our discussion. If you're having trouble with Zoom, you can message Superior Health using the chat box and we'll be able to assist you. If you have any questions or comments during our presentation by both speakers, please use the chat box to post your questions and one of our staff can address your question at the end of the presentations. Please help us foster a positive learning environment when asking questions and making comments. And remember that we are all here to learn from each other. And now to begin our discussion, uh, we would like to welcome both Laura Apple from the Michigan Health and Hospital Association, who serves as the Senior President, uh, Vice President of and Chief Innovation Officer, along with Nicholas Moret, Director of Business Development and Post-Acute Transitions with Sava Senior Care Midwest, who will share their perspective on updating, developing, and implementing policies and protocols to address COVID-19 in healthcare settings. Laura, we will begin with you. Thank you for joining, and please make sure you unmute yourself. I Hi, Laura. That you oh, we can hear you now. Thank you. My apologies. We, I think you were on mute, so feel free to begin now. Okay. Uh, we just sometimes we have a problem with the um, speakers in our in our room here. So the uh, we did do a handout in advance of the meeting today, and I hope you had a chance to look at that. The state is still operating under an executive order which restricts entry into healthcare facilities, and this includes. Uh, it still includes hospitals as well as residential care facilities, congregate care, and juvenile justice facilities. But what the most recent executive order allowed was that if hospitals, including psych hospitals, and other health care facilities such as outpatient clinics and doctor's offices, if they were willing to do a series of activities which are listed on the handout, then those organizations do not need to comply with 
the requirements under the executive order. Note that that those organizations allowed to, as I call it, get out from under the executive order do not include skilled nursing facilities uh, or juvenile justice facilities, assisted living, or adult foster care. So all of those organizations are still operating under the full executive order. That being said, I think that the time is going to come when they too will have this um, less restrictive visitor policy available. I'm not going to go through all of the pieces that are on the list. I'll point out a few things. Number one, there is no specific limitation on the number of visitors that may be allowed per patient. But there is only a requirement that visitors be limited. There is a specific requirement that visitors must wear a mask or other cloth face covering if they are medically able to do so. This brought up a conversation uh, among the membership. Somebody said to us, well, so what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to, like, we, we kick these people out? We're supposed to escort them out of the facility? And I was really uh, relieved that one of the legal counsels for the hospital, for a, a hospital system spoke up and said, yes, just as someone who doesn't comply with our smoking policy or with our policy that they wear shoes or other things that we require of visitors, we, we will remove those people from our, or from our facility premises. We've done it before and we will continue to do it related to this policy as well. And this is something that we're familiar with doing and we know how to do it. Uh, one of the things that we talked about extensively was communicating about this policy and the hospital association did, made, made quite an effort to share information with the membership extensively before the restrictions were available to be loosened and, uh, and then of course as, as soon as we got the actual information in writing. We wanted organizations to be able to share uh, to, to see some kind of consistent messaging about what they might want to do in terms of their visitor policies because what came out in the executive director directive which allows hospitals and outpatient facilities, doctor's offices to no longer be restricted by the executive order, different from the executive directive, is, is very um, flexible. And so what do you do, you know, if one organization is saying, you know, you can have five visitors and another organization is saying you can only have one. So we shared information to with the entire membership showing them, you know, what basically we had gathered from around the the membership and said, you know, we think there might be safety in numbers if you all want to take a look at this. This is probably the consensus among the members and it looks like this is what a lot of people are using now and are likely to continue using in terms of limitations on members and other policies. One thing that I think we really overlooked and you know, you, you, we're every time, we, you know, for most of us, not all of us, but for most of us this was our first pandemic and um, what I did not expect was as soon as the executive order, which allowed for this flexibility for organizations that wanted to implement the other requirements, I was not prepared for a number of headlines almost immediately that said, hey, great news, the governor lifted restrictions on visitors to hospitals, pretty much there's no limitations anymore, this is great. Uh, of course, there is extens extensive nuance in the uh, what is in that executive order and the accompanying executive directive. So we, what I would do next time is I would have spent probably more time preparing our relationships in the media for how this was going to be a continuation of visitor policies, not a lifting of all visitor policies, that there would continue to be extensive restrictions. For example, cafeterias are still not open. Their visitors are restricted to certain areas. There are limits on the number of visitors. If people are have family members who have COVID, that, that is almost certainly going to restrict visitors to few or even none, depending on the seriousness of their disease. And then finally, I want to make one last comment, which is I think throughout the pandemic, 
the, the, the number one lesson we learned is that we keep calling these visitor policies. They're really patient care policies. We all have had experiences that we know if we have a family member or another loved one hospitalized, we very much want to be with that person. And when we can't, it is heartrending. Uh, in the patient, it's not, it, it, is a, it is a terrible thing for them. And so evaluating these um, policies is not, I think we've all learned here, we knew it, we, we kind of knew this, but it has become much more front facing that these are mechanisms for understanding how we deliver this portion of the patient care in the context of a pandemic, in the context of a deadly infectious disease. Uh, but that's, that's where the evaluation is, is, you know, we, we've got to do these limits. It, it is a patient care problem. Um, you know, how do we respond? How do we both maintain infectious disease control, but recognize that, you know, this is uh, Im imposing limits on patient care? Yeah, we call it a visitor policy, but it's part, it's part of a patient care policy. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you, uh, Laura, so much. Um, you know, I wanted to touch on if you could kind of expand. You know, I think one of the key lessons learned from the Michigan perspective, again, you know, the guidelines that we are sharing here um, are Michigan perspective, and we have Wisconsin and Minnesota folks. And so I think this kind of serves as a lesson learned again. How can we, how can you as states be more proactive in your approach of developing uh, these policies and protocols in your organization? One of the things, Alor, that I want to touch on really quickly that you can expand on is the critical need to bring different levels of organization context together, like HR and like the lawyer um, associations of different hospital associations. Can you touch on that, how um, that kind of went and helped kind of support? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, throughout the, you know, it's starting almost immediately, our first uh, two infections were detected on March 10th. And by March 13th, 14th, we were down to a core group of hospital association employees um, seeing each other in person, and but had expanded into regular contact with uh, cohorts of our membership, uh, sometimes twice a week, certainly once a week. We now talk uh, weekly with our ep hospital epidemiologists, our chief medical officers, our legal counsel, and then on and off with other, org uh, other parts of the organization. More recently, we added lab directors. Um, and so when, the visit when we knew the visitor policy was going to change, we had an opportunity in uh, about 24 hours, actually fewer than that, to talk to the EPIs, the CMOs, and the legal counsel about what we were expecting to see and you know what we hoped the outcome would be. The first draft was terrible, and we had a chance to respond. Um, we, we were really pleased with what we did see. Uh, for example, you know, you say, well, you know, give me an example of what, what was what was bad. Well, the first draft of the executive directive said all patients must enter through one door. And my response to the person from the executive office who called me was, no. <laughs> I wasn't even very polite about it. It's just like, we have huge organizations. Outpatient surgeries might be done at one end of the facility, and um, emergency departments have, always have to be open. Are you telling me that everyone has to come in through the emergency room? Uh, so, it, it, but it was, you know, we, we have regular conversations, and we also have established, of course, a very close-knit relationship with both the department and the executive office through this uh, pandemic. Thank you, Laura. And again, as a key lesson learned, I think, again, within your healthcare organization and institution, consider bringing these key partners to meet together and separate and try to be more proactive in your approach and, and take some of the lessons learned from states like Michigan who have been hard hit to be more proactive and even proposing to your state uh, you know, legislature as well as your governors in, in making sure that you're more proactive in addressing these policies and protocol recommendations. So thank you for that, Laura. Next, I would like to welcome Nick uh, to kind of give the skilled nursing in perspective. Nicholas, can you hear us okay? I can, yeah. Let me turn on my video here as well. Uh, you'll have to excuse me. I had to overtake uh, the baby's room uh, as my home office as we shifted to 
uh, not being out in the field all the time. So if the door flies open and you see a toddler uh, run in here, my apologies in advance. <laughs> so um, all part of right, right. So, um, but yeah, very similar. To, you know, to, to what Laura uh, just mentioned. Uh, you know, we're kind of figuring it all out. Um, I would say in this time, the only constant that that all of us I think can agree on is change. Uh, every single day, uh, even sometimes multiple times within a day, uh, there's a policy change or a shift in how we have to work and how we have to uh, do what our new norm is. Um, and so one of the things that we are looking at as a, an organization is um, opening back up. How do we do it? Uh, and and what we're starting to really see is as with, the C, with CMS and CDC uh, and then the specific states that there are every state is different. Um, so we can't just have a one size fits all approach on opening up because there very well could be a, a very specific executive order on how that works state by state. Uh, we have, of course, already started to kick the tires a little bit in, in understanding how that may look, what we think, you know, we as an organization should use as guidance for all of our centers and then drill down to the state specific requirements. Um, and and uh, in, in my territory, I've got eight buildings in Southeast Michigan uh, that were very hard hit with COVID. I've got two buildings in Pittsburgh uh, that uh, have about 10 patients that are COVID positive actually right now, unfortunately. And then we have four buildings in West Virginia. Uh, and only one of those buildings has had a COVID outbreak. Um, but in specifically with our West Virginia buildings, uh, one of our administrators uh, was on was asked to be a part of the task force for the state in reopening uh, to visitors. And actually here in 12 minutes, uh, there is a, a West Virginia uh, call where they are going to be rolling out the different uh, parameters around opening up to visitors for skilled nursing facilities in West Virginia. And uh, luckily, I was given access to kind of the draft of the policy that's going to be discussed here in 12 minutes for West Virginia. Um, and it was along kind of some of the thought process that we were having is how it was going to open up. Uh, and, and there's essentially different phases, if you will, and different criteria and benchmarks that each building has to essentially hit uh, before they can move to the next level, if you will, uh, to have less restrictions on who can and cannot come into the centers. Um, so I'm gonna, I'll dive into it and read a little bit of it. And then on top of that, we also do have a couple um, unique specific stories of how we creatively um, have worked uh, with getting families at least to be close enough to visit. So I'll, I'll touch on that after I, I dive in with West Virginia. Um, so they have, uh, their phases are, are essentially color coded. They've got a blue phase, a yellow phase, and a green phase. Um, and essentially, uh, it is kind of living off of that 14 day uh, benchmark, uh, whether it's through test based or non test based strategies. Uh, to not have any COVID exposure in your facility. So that first phase, phase blue, um, is, is essentially kind of you have to meet criteria that for 14 days you have not had anyone that is COVID positive or showing any symptoms. At that time in that phase, only um, hospice, compassionate care, end-of-life visitors are, are, are welcome or are allowed, excuse me. Um, and then after that 14-day benchmark has been hit, you transition into the yellow phase. Um, and Again, you've, you've completed the previous 14 days and, and now you're in the yellow phase and the limited visitation uh, starts in this phase. Uh, and and uh, so there's no more than two visitors allowed at the same time. Uh, it is appointment based uh, and the, the visits uh, must, they're, they're taking place in a designated area within the facility and not within the residence rooms. So whether that's, you know, the, a larger dining room, uh, you know, uh, the front lobby, if you've got a large lobby, you know, some, some of our centers have uh, some larger ancillary, uh, you know, therapy gyms that they're kind of turning into, uh, you know, essentially visitation rooms. Um, and, there's, uh, and there's time limits that, are, are, that can be imposed at the facility's discretion. Uh, no visitors under 12 are, are welcome for the yellow phase. And uh, they still must practice social distancing and wear masks and, and, and proper hand hygiene. Um, and then after 14 days within yellow, uh, you then transition to the green phase. Um, and uh, there's in, in, uh, in that green phase, the visitation is uh, number and age of visitors are able to be determined by the facility. 
Um, so it's not a hard and fast, this is how many you can have. It is open to that facility uh, to be able to determine uh, if they want to keep it at two. They want to um, allow certain circumstances for a larger family to come in and visit. That will be up to the facility, the center, to make that determination. Uh, but continuing to be appointment-based uh, as well as in the designated location and um, continuing to have, uh, you know, uh, social practicing social distancing, appropriate hand hygiene, and, and wearing face masks as well. Um, and through every single phase, there is always the screening that is continuing to take place that all of us are now used to if we've gone into a center, a hospital, wherever, uh, where we're taking the temperature, we're asking, have you been around anyone that has shown signs or symptoms, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and throughout these phases, if there is any new COVID positive patient uh, or two or more COVID positive patients that pop up, uh, automatically that center is moved back to the blue phase. And it doesn't matter where they are. They can be yellow, they can be green, but if they do have two COVID positives in that center, they are back to that blue phase, which means they, they, they can't have visitation except for compassionate care. And then they have to go through the 14 days to move to yellow again. Um, so some, and again, state specific for West Virginia, we don't have any West Virginia folks on this call, but I do kind of envision since they're kind of the first that have really kind of rolled this out, uh, that this will probably be, um, applied in some fashion, some way for a lot of our states, uh, that, that we're, you know, that we're operating in and, and more than likely we, again, as I was mentioning first, that we, we were kind of going down this path as well, that there's going to be different phases to it. Um, and, and basically have to graduate to the next level to open up even more and more. Um, so uh, timing is perfect because I just got this stuff this morning. So it's perfect for the call. Um, but and then changing years as well. Um, uh, it, what we have done in some of our centers, uh, we have we've gotten pretty creative with with ways to allow socially distancing uh, attempts at visitation uh, during this pandemic when when no one was allowed inside the center. So. Uh, Specifically, our, our one West Virginia building, uh, who the administrator was on the task force uh, on Mother's Day, they, you know, they did reach out to the state, told them what they were doing, kind of got the tip of the cap. Um, but they set up in their parking lot um, a 10 by 10 pop up tent and had clearly marked 10 feet distance. They, you know, made it very homely. They put some sides around, you know, a side on like one side of it for a backdrop. They had a table, flowers, some artwork. And they brought in, you know, some of their chairs for their lobby for the visitors to sit in. And then uh, with uh, the clinical team, assessed all the patients uh, that were in-house that from a, uh, you know, from, from a um, symptomology standpoint, are they safe? Are they able to? Making sure that there's been no relative signs or symptoms, fevers for the past 72 hours. And then scheduled times for social distance parking lot visitation with, with our families. Uh, and that was received very, very, very well uh, by by the, the both the residents, uh, our, our patients, as well as uh, the family members. And it was, you know, really the first time that in months they had been able to really kind of lay eyes on them without looking at a screen. Um, and then in, in Michigan, uh, we have a, a building that uh, their parking lot backs up to a one-way street. Uh, so we um, moved all the cars out of the parking lot, scheduled times, and we use kind of the parking spaces as our socially distancing zones. And we, you know, essentially had our, our patients in, in wheelchairs, in, in their wheelchairs, in their parking spot. And then we scheduled times, you know, in, in the way that the parking lot worked and the street worked, there was about five patients um, at a time. And we would schedule with their families where they would be able to drive up on that one-way street, park their car, and, you know, roll down their windows and, and have a conversation uh, as best they could, uh, but as we know, some of our, our, our patients are, are rather hard of hearing, so it was a lot of yelling uh, from cars, but uh, that was also received very well by the families. So um, creatively working within, in, within the new parameters state by state um, is going to allow a, a center to be able to do something that, and, and, but more importantly, the physical plant and physical layout are, are also going to be a factor. You know, we only have really one center that we can do the drive up parade uh, visitation with just because of where the, the, the location of our other centers are. Um, 
And the same thing with the West Virginia approach too. You know, they, they, they do make it abundantly clear that this is visitation guidance, visitation guidelines, and due to the physical plant, due to the to the, the layout of that center, there may not be an ability to have a designated visitation, and and those centers are going to have to through their their county. Um, health departments and and, and state um, representatives be able to figure out how they would be able to 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 operate within the new visitation guidance uh, and reopening plans uh, in relation to their specific centers. So, um, an attempt at a one size fit all visitation policy in, in West Virginia, uh, with still the, the 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 disclaimer that this may not work everywhere, and, and we got to work together with it. So, uh, but that's that's pretty much it for me. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I thank you guys very much for the opportunity to let me come on and speak with you guys and let you know what kind of we're, we're seeing and what we're doing. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nicholas, for the fantastic information. And I think the key um, in both of the presentations is, again, one policy may not fit all situations. And I know that, unfortunately, sometimes there will be situations where you have to evaluate the needs of the patient, the need of the resident and their caregivers and, you know, find a way to kind of find a happy medium. We do have a couple of questions um, for both speakers related to skilled nursing home and hospital perspective regarding uh, masks. Are facilities requiring surgical masks or are cloth masks acceptable? And related to that mask question also, um, if visitors don't have masks but wish to comply, are they provided one or must they bring their own? So twofold. Are masks required and cloth masks okay? And if they don't have masks, will your facilities and hospitals provide masks for our visitors? So for the skilled Nick, nursing world, you know, for for um, for visitors, we we will require masks, um, and if they do not have one, we would absolutely uh, provide them with a surgical mask. And and currently throughout the the entire pandemic, you know, right, we we've done screening at all of our centers at the door by a licensed nurse for everyone that's coming in, um, and you know, right next to the you know gallon size. Um, a jug of, of hand sanitizer, you know, we, you know, every, every little, you know, screening station has a, has an unopened bo or a box of surgical masks. And if, if someone forgets one or, you know, it's a little, you know, used or well, well worn, uh, you know, we will place that out for, for hand genes, uh, for, for uh, proper infection control parameters. So yes, they would be provided one if they do not have one. So in, under the Michigan executive directive, a mask is required. It may be a cloth mask. Uh, the directive does not require facilities to make them available, uh, and I do not have information about whether or not um, hospital facilities are making them available. My guess is that they are, uh, the, my guess is that the larger the organization and the larger the facility, the more likely they are to be making them available, but it, the executive directive does not require surgical mask. Okay, wonderful. The other question um, is for those facilities that are reopening, are you limiting the length of time for a visitor or more family members can visit, so more family members can visit? Um, say that it, it, that is, oh, sorry, I was just going to say for Michigan, uh, the executive director definitely requires a limitation on visitor hours. And for the skilled nursing setting, um, you know, again, it has not been, you know, we are still actively working on that. So, of course, this could change in an hour tomorrow, mm -hmm. <laughs> next week. Mm -hmm. But um, I would assume, I would think that we would, especially in the in the beginning of the visitation periods, limit those uh, visits um, to, you know, a certain, you know, probably 15, or not 15, it's probably about a half an hour max so that we can get more visitors in. Um, you know, the law, of course, everyone wants to spend all day, you know, some of, some of their family members would want to come back in that, that routinely, you know, pre-pandemic, we're spending the entire day at our facilities with their loved ones. Uh, so to be fair and to make sure that we can get as many people scheduled and many people in, uh, I, I would, I would absolutely assume that we would have a cap initially on, on the time being that, that, that they can come in and spend and visit with, with residents. Wonderful. Um, I know from one hospital perspective, uh, they were kind of triaging the visit numbers and, and different family members at the uh, caregiver or visitor registration desk. So they would require, of course, for the patient room uh, to, to be clear of the next visitor and kind of work with the family members to communicate when uh, everyone is coming to. So again, a lot of it is kind of 
uh, you know, adjusting as you see. And the other question we have is, are HHC loosening the PPE restrictions for non-COVID patients? Are you starting to return to normal workflow processes in the field and in the office? So based on that conversation with the epidemiologist, no. <laughs> I think that uh, in, uh, in, in most settings there is, um, in any setting where there is any kind of aerosol generating procedure or the possibility of one, there is ex extensive use of PPE. And uh, I believe that just about everyone is using extra time on both back at the front end and back end of uh, surgical procedures. But I think, you know, with the just about everywhere there is, um, you know, masking is remaining in place. Uh, it's, um, I, I don't see a return to um, lower levels of PPE use for in the, in the settings that have been out from under the executive order, I don't see that for some time. Wh wh whether or not there's an order, I think that that's how the epidemiologists feel about it. Nicholas, any any perspective on that question? <clears throat> um, the you know for, for when a new admission comes into our center, uh, if they are asymptomatic, um, we are not requiring a test to come in. We are looking very closely at the vitals, um, uh, making sure there's no fevers over the past 72 hours. But any admission that comes into our center uh, or return from a hospitalization, our residents are isolated for 14 days. And then um, on day 12, our organization, uh, uh, we have purchased a large number of tests ourselves and through sourcing through local county um, and state um, ability to get more tests, we are, are testing those patients on our isolation units on day 12 to get the results back within 48 hours to then graduate them off of the isolation unit back into the regular um, uh, side of the facility, whether that's back to their long-term care room or back to our or to the short-term rehab unit, and when they do transition back to that unit, they are off of the dropper precautions. They are off of, you know, the <clears throat> the more intense, if you will, uh, PPE usage, the full you know the full mask, um, gown, mat, um, uh, uh, face shields, etc. And when so when they transition off of that back to the other units, at that point, it is up to them if they are going to to wear a mask or not. Uh, we strongly encourage it, and we will provide it um, as well, and, and especially if they're going out to group therapy, concurrent therapy, uh, or they're, 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 they're socially distancing uh, in the dining room. Uh, you know, so it's not a requirement, uh, but it is something that we strongly encourage. Wonderful. And, Nicholas, while we have you, uh, there's another question. How are centers working with families who provide care to residents on a weekly or more frequent basis? So the, you know, it's, it's still, you know, kind of the same way as it was, um, you know, pre-pandemic in the sense that, it, you know, we are, are still communicating really with the families, any change of the condition, we're, we're reaching out and letting them know if there's, you know, a hospitalization has to occur. We're, of course, letting them know what led to that hospitalization and kind of where they went and to fill them in. Um, so if there are any concerns um, or updates from a, from a clinical standpoint, if, if an uh, involved family member is not able to be there weekly as they usually were, uh, we have, um, you know, made, made the, the, the unit manager, the director of nursing, the administrator, they have become much, you know, they, they have, especially with some of our patients that ask for regular updates, we are essentially scheduling calls. And, and letting them, hey, here's your update, um, you know, here's what's going on. And then if there's any concerns or questions, you know, same, same, same as before, you know, we, we're getting the, the, the concern or we're getting the request to look into something else. And then, you know, we're going to the doctor or, or, or whatever the case may be to, to address the situation that may be there. Um, so our organization has sent a lot more laptops and tablets to all of our centers because we are, um, uh, you know, the one great thing about the pandemic, which is a weird statement to make, so apologize, but uh, is that it has really forced telehealth on doctors and on skilled nursing facilities and hospitals. Uh, so it is almost a little bit easier to, uh, to, to now in this environment to be able to get a doc on a telehealth visit than it was to be able to get an appointment for someone to go out. 
Um, so because of the increased uh, technology that has been given to all of our centers, um, our activities department, our therapy department, you know, even just our, our receptionists, they are, they are helping and scheduling regular Zoom calls, FaceTime calls. Um, so uh, we are, are, are shifting with technology in the new environment that we're in to be able to address any concerns that are out there. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Uh, just a comment to that, uh, you know, from a attendee, we need to find an active family balance, especially with cognitively challenged patients. Example, all summer patients get used to their routines, and I've heard this is a challenge for some families. And I think it's a, a critical point to consider. And um, through that, uh, many of you um, from the hospital and skilled nursing home perspective have, you know, resident or patient advisory councils. Um, I know I sit on one of my hospital ones, and we just met virtually to discuss this very issue. I think it's critical that we work with family and caregivers on finding a, a happy balance where infection prevention is a priority, but that we find that balance for patients that need their family support. So thank you for that comment. We have one more question. Has there been any discussions with nursing facilities, assisted living, allowing for vendors to, uh, or vendor visitations? Um, so, uh, short answer is, is, is yes, that is actually addressed in the West Virginia rollout, uh, um, there where, um, again, depending upon the phase that you're in would determine, uh, the level of vendor access to a center. Um, but, um, and, and it is, it is, and it is also facility specific as well. So that there is a little bit more leeway, if you will, and the buildings be able to create to the centers to be able to create kind of their non-essential personnel, visitors, vendors, uh, policies, than then the family visitation to see their loved ones that are residents of our centers. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, the green phase, the, 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 the furthest along phase, um, you know, it's, they're, they're allowed in the center, still socially distancing, um, you know, but I, I would see that rather than, you know, just the, the floodgates opening and everyone kind of coming back in, that it would, uh, similar to like my, my liaisons in the, in the hospitals, there's a, a couple that have access to hospitals in some other states. Um, and yes, vendors are able to go back into the hospitals, but it is still essentially by appointment. You, you have to have permission and approval uh, from that case manager to go do that on-site on that asymptomatic patient um, in, in order to come in. And essentially, you kind of have to name drop that case manager at the screening door to be able to get by the screener at the front door of the hospital. So I would envision that there would be some component to that uh, within our organization that, uh, you know, say for a home health liaison to come in, uh, they're going to they're gonna come in because they've got a, a specific referral uh, that they are coming in to get their, their clinical information that they need to start services and to and have a conversation with that patient or family member. Um, but, you know, going, you know, going right back to, you know, hey, I, I've got a, um, you know, I've got an hour in my afternoon and I'm driving by a skilled nursing facility and I'm going to pop in, say hi and speak to that social worker. Um, I'm not so confident, especially in the beginning opening of the, of the visitation with, with family members coming in that that would be, you know, welcome or allowed, if you will, uh, because, you know, the patient and staff safety is, is of course paramount. And, and as these visitations are, are opening back up and we're allowing family members to come back in, um, you know, we're still going to be keeping a very close eye on those patients that did have visitors and, and, and going to increase our, um, <clears throat> our routine rounding, our vital checks, uh, you know, especially after those visitors to make sure that they didn't, um, you know, pick up COVID from, from, from a loved one. Uh, so we're still going to kind of be watching that closely, um, and and but eventually down the road, yes, I, I do see that that we will get back to that. But initially, appointment only would be would be my best bet. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, one last question. So with the ever changing, um, you know, updates and policies and guidelines from the state. Um, any key lessons learned on how do you communicate with the public? I mean, th you know, we heard in the midst of the pandemic, you know, things were changing on a daily basis. And so that needs for patients and caregivers and residents to know, but no information that may have lapsed and is now updated. Any key lessons there? And I'll start with you, Nick, and then Laura. Sure, sure. So um, the way that our organization has handled this is 100% is, is transparency. Uh, in all of our centers, when we have had that first breakout, we, um, at, at all hands on deck, we are contacting every single um, either responsible party or guardian of all of the other residents that are in our centers to let them know that we had COVID positive 
uh, patient either that's in our center or that has been has, has been hospitalized and has tested positive. Um, so we're not hiding behind anything. We're not trying to pretend like something isn't here. And, and we are um, at that point in time. And, and we're kind of letting them know, you know essentially what you kind of phrased in your questioning is everything is changing every single day. Um, and and we're, we're referencing today right now. Here is where we are. Uh, and then, you know, of co- and we let them know that, of course, this could change tonight. This could change tomorrow. This could change next week. So, you know, don't hesitate to reach back out to us to ask us any specific questions because there could be new guidance the next time that you call. And we've got we can do X instead of Y. Um, so uh, but but not hiding behind anything, not not, you know, when a hospital calls and say, hey, what's going on? What do you guys got? Going? You know, telling them exactly what's going on. Um, And and in Michigan, we had a regional hub strategy uh, and specifically with our organization uh, because of initially PPE conservation, uh, staff conservation uh, with those staff that were educated on how to properly um, in this environment down and off PPE care for COVID positive patients. We created two centers where we we did transfer all of our COVID positive patients from our other uh, six centers. Um, and, and knock on wood, we actually have one center in Michigan that was has not had one uh, COVID positive patient through this pandemic. Um, our other seven absolutely have. And some of our centers have had big numbers. Um, and we use that strategy um, in, in a transferring those patients, uh, getting them into our COVID positive unit, um, and then testing them uh, f- to make sure that they are negative. And then we consider them COVID positive recovery patients and then transfer them back to their center of origin where they are then isolated again for another 15 day, 14 days, excuse me, at their new center, at their home center before they go back to their regular either long term care room or back to their short term rehab unit. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Uh, Laura, any any comments or feedback on lessons learned? Hey, Eva, this is Brittany. I'm sorry, Laura had to step away, um, but I would just, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay, great. Um, I would just reiterate that we're completely on board with the transparency. I think there's been great examples. The information changes so frequently, but you know, I think uh, providers across the healthcare continuum have been doing an amazing job and a huge kudos to the communication teams that have been creating public facing and patient friendly documents and posters and flyers that can go out and help people understand um, what the latest uh, guidance are. I've seen a lot of different things on social media, et cetera. So I think people are getting a lot more creative of how to get that word out quickly, but it is a full-time job to try to digest on a daily basis what's coming out and how do we communicate that most effectively and transparently to to the people we serve. Wonderful. Thank you all so very much for the wonderful guidance and feedback from your perspective. I think there's a lot of key lessons learned here. And uh, we would love to continue on the discussion in our state-based um, call or, or subgroups that um, Elena will now direct us on how to engage on. So um, again, consider all of these questions and uh, consider sharing kind of what you're doing as well as we uh, get it within our state specific cohort. So Elena, if you'd like to provide the links and additional instructions. Yeah, so thank you all for your participation. So this concludes the presentation topic portion of the call, and we will be transitioning to the state-specific breakout rooms momentarily. 